Hey guys, welcome to the Trinity Podcast. We hope that this podcast is going to be a really helpful companion to what goes on in here on a Sunday. We're going to have a series of conversations. I'm actually going to invite you into a series of conversations I've been happening, having with friends of mine. These are the kind of things we can't necessarily get into on a Sunday morning or evening, but they're really important for our discipleship. And they're going to enable us to go a bit deeper in our faith. And so really think this is going to be a valuable tool in the life of this church. We hope you really enjoy it. Well, welcome to episode four of the podcast that we've been doing. It still is in search of a name. And we have been talking, <laughs> Roger, haven't we? about what it means to pursue God's presence, really, or be pursued by God's presence. The language we've used is how can we learn how to be present to the presence, to God, in the present moment. And in our first episode, we talked about pursuing God's presence. In the second episode, we talked about how we actually begin to practice that, practice of the presence, which is language, I think, stolen from Brother Lawrence, perhaps. Is mm, that right? Yes, Indeed. Episode three, we talked, the last episode, we talked about the blocks, the obstacles that yeah. we face when we actually start to try and live in this way and practice this. Mm -hmm. And now we're going to look at what some of the benefits for us. And as I, in a very fleshy way, just said to you off podcast, what's in it for me? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing, Johnny. Oh. <laughs> I, I mean, to rephrase that question, if I may. <laughs> okay, go on then. I, I think the, the way, of, the, the kind of question we're trying to ask is, what difference did this make? Yeah. So we've talked about, it's great to do it. Here's how you do it. Here's why we struggle to do it. But you could say we haven't really asked the question, why do it? You know, what, what benefit does this have to the human race? If we're going to talk in pragmatic terms, apart from the idea of we're designed for God mm -hmm. and we want to find our home in him, which is, is the way it is. Um, so I think I started doing it because I felt I had to I felt that all sort of roads led to being present to God that, that that had been part of my history as I've described it seemed to be those were the greatest moments of significance for me in life and then what I found when I started doing it, so I, I mean we've been discussing our various practices and getting up early in the morning and how we make that work and I think there's lots of different ways to do that but the feedback I've got from other people is that they've just said you're a much nicer person <laughs> <laughs> as a result of doing that less driven less likely to be um, aggravating or envious or, or judgmental um, and I think I noticed that in myself so even, even though I wouldn't necessarily go oh I'm I'm a much better person, but I just do notice that I'm much more settled. You know, you know the difference between being aggravated and not being aggravated. You know when you're filled with lust and thinking about what you want out of other people rather than just being there mm. for them. I think you know when you're, you're kind of grinding your teeth in resentment versus, oh, this is quite hard, but I'm just going to get on with it and do the work. Um, I, I think you know when you're looking at the people around you and being envious of their success their good looks, their money, um, their position, versus when you're just not doing that, you can live with the fact that other people have some stuff that looks really good and you can get that. So, so I think in the end, what, what I would say is the, the sort of virtue element of it, that sort of building of virtue. One, one of the things that the cloud of unknowing says is that it says um, all virtues are found in God. Mm. You know, he's the source of all of it. Um, and it even goes so far as say it says... Virtue is nothing more than um, a mature and deliberate affection plainly um, offered to God. Virtue is nothing more. I love that nothing more. Mm. Virtue is nothing more than absolutely everything that we're now <laughs> going to talk about. So it's not a reductive definition of virtue. And then it has that idea of a sort of... Um, a sort of maturity... And a deliberation. Yes, so we're choosing. So when we're praying in this way, we're choosing to return our attention over and over and over again to God. But in the process of doing that, there's a maturity that comes our way mm -hmm. in that in that deliberateness. And I, I just kind of think about the way um, 
you know when wine growers talk about uh, I, I can't say my r's properly so i'm afraid i can't say this word in french but they talk about something called the terroir terroir yeah or something like that yeah. yeah yeah and it's basically the entire climate yeah. soil geography everything that's involved in in making yes. good wine yeah and it seems to me that that's what we're doing in contemplation is that we are creating the entire atmosphere climate geography yeah positioning that allows god to mature us in, yeah. into christ-like character a similar word would be uh, ecology mm, yeah that word eco comes from the greek word oikos means household yeah so we're creating in contemplative prayer or centering prayer whatever we're calling it a new ecology yeah now an the, ecology of virtue yeah. Well, would you know what's fascinating about you using that word is that there's a in sort of management consultant world that there's an idea called theory you have you ever heard of this no. and theory you um is a theory of how um it uses the term presencing mm. how do we so the word for practicing the presence in this theory is presencing how do we make sure that as leaders as managers as groups and employees we are presencing ourselves in the way our organizations work and the way they're structured and, and the sort of key sort of twist of awareness it talks about it says we go from ego awareness mm. it's all about me to eco awareness wow. what does this whole system yes. require from me so yeah. it goes from all being about me to a sort of other yeah outer centered way of viewing which, things which is i mean just looking kind of now more broadly and, and really answering this question, what are the main benefits of practicing the present? So, I mean, of course, the way I framed the question showed how much I need the practice because I made it what's in it for me. Yeah. The, part, of the, part of the answer to that question is not just what's in it for me or those around me, which is how you answered it, but what's in it for the whole world? I mean, mm. we've got a climate crisis and we've got a, you know, it's scarcity of resource. Can't go on living the way that we're living. Yeah. What if part of the answer to those questions is actually this way of praying yeah because if i am going to become more aware of the ecosystem the world around me by doing this then it's an urgent need that every one of us start to think yeah. and pray in this way yeah I, and the, the sort of sad thing that that sort of strikes me is just as i wasn't ready really to pray in that way until i encountered an absolute limit mm. or a sort of failure in my strategies I just really worry that we as a human race may not be ready to embrace this way of being until we've encountered a catastrophic failure as yeah. a, as a well, of, we've had one a with species. a virus. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but again, necessity is the mother of invention. Yeah. I mean, I think that is true. Well, would you know what's fascinating is that when you look at the mystical writing, like the cloud of unknowing, it's literally written in the middle of a war, yeah. in the middle of the plague. Yeah. So it's face. It's not like some monk hiding away from the world in all this kind of stuff it's literally facing what they felt was the end of the world mm -hmm. at that point in time yeah and they turned to contemplation so uh, it's, it's one of the reasons that encouraged me to start reading it i'm like i want to read someone who was writing during a pandemic a pandemic it was actually much worse than ours was Absolutely. this time around but um mm -hmm. that encouraged me to look at it so You've articulated something of you become a nicer person, and I suppose to to, to give that a a word, we might call that virtue, or the word that you use a lot because you're actually a psychologist of this is mm. character. Yeah. Um, how does this practice facilitate growth of character? Mm. Now, th th there's lots of ways to answer this question. So the weird thing is that when you are practicing contemplative prayer in the way that I've described it so lifting your heart in love gently to God um, firstly you're actually practicing loving to begin with so that just that effect just practicing that affection and even when you look at psychological studies done on this it will say that 20 minutes in the morning spent in loving meditation impacts not only your health and positivity but the next person you meet mm. and the next person they meet and potentially even the next person they meet. Right. And so even Chain just... reaction. Yeah, so just purely <laughs> physiologically, before we even talk about God or prayer, the fact that you put yourself in a loving state physiologically ripples through your environment in all kinds of different ways. And I notice that just in my connectedness to other people. I just notice that I'm much more... Overall, my self-concern and much more connected to my family, my friends, my colleagues... Uh, my neighbours, you know, people I meet 
on campus when I'm working, I just notice that there's a much greater sense of love and connectedness. Um, let, let's talk about the theological virtue. So, in, so hope mm-hmm. is the same as well, that, that in the sense that when you've practiced that, you start to feel that even though it's slow, even though it's very <laughs> deliberate and seems to take ages, um, you do feel that you are changing. So, so they, there's sort of one view of personal transformation that almost views it as I, I was running this program and I'm going to run a different program. So I was running a program called um, Despair and now I'm going to run one called Hope. Um, and that's a sort of limited way of viewing it. And the way I've sort of experienced uh, Contemplative Pro, it's not so much that it's my software that's being changed. Mm. It's my firmware, it's my operating system is yeah. being altered. So my entire being is, it's the fact that I can sense just this movement in my entire being. Mm. And many people who pray in this way describe that, just gives you a sense of hope. It just means things can move, things can shift. If I can change, other things can change too. And then thirdly, let, let's hit faith as well, given that we're doing <laughs> the faith, three. Faith and love. Um, is that that living, lifting our hearts with a humble stirring of love to God it is an act of faith. Yeah. It's literally a deposit of everything that I am, I'm going to give to you, God, now. And um, th- there used to be a time when I used to think that... Um, th- do you remember that there was an old cartoon that I used to read at youth club, and it was a picture of a, a pipe that's full of garbage and God's on one side and I'm on the other side and Jesus comes away and takes away all the garbage and then me and God can embrace. And it was just this little cartoon telling you what Jesus had done for you in the gospel. It's quite nice. It was a nice little idea. Um, but increasingly I've started to realize that faith is the contact with God. That faith, As I said earlier, faith becomes invisible when you're in contact with God because it just is. You just are in contact with God. And therefore sin is lack of contact with God. Mm. Sin is anything that just comes between you and him. It's not, it, it does, it's not necessarily even evil. It's not even necessarily lack of virtue. It's just other stuff that, that sort of distracts you. distracts you. And therefore, weirdly, sin actually is a relative term because it's about where you're standing relative to God. It's anything mm. that kind of gets in the way of that contactfulness with God. So faith, hope, and love, I feel, are just being practiced as part of it. Also, the fact that you keep returning to the same thing over and over and over again, you're actually strengthening your self-control while mm. you do it. You're like just building it like a moral muscle. Mm. Um, you're also strengthening your persistence mm-hmm. at the same time because you're, um, you know, just the fact that you keep turning up and doing it even on days when you don't want to means that you believe there's something important in here and something that needs to be done whether or not it feels good on that particular day. Um, so you can see as I go on, you just see there are just lots and lots of virtues and character strengths yeah. that are being used while you do it. And so what, one of the ways I've sort of developed this is I, I've developed my own form of praying, Johnny, believe it or not. <laughs> Tell us about it. Um, so you've heard of centering prayer because we've talked about it a lot. But I, I sort of um, took all my working character strengths and sort of combined it with centering prayer and developed something that I've called strengthening prayer, which is one of the ways that I practice this um and strengthening prayer basically takes character strengths or moral qualities or good qualities of character if you like and applies them into this kind of praying so just as in centering prayer you would you would have a very simple word in strengthening prayer you might actually choose a particular maybe hope or love or um quite often you want to keep them short words like to be wise or be or remain or, or you pick up the sort of words that you want to develop and you present those to God and receive them back from him in that kind of mm. loop as you're doing it. it. It also is a way of dealing with distractions as well that come up. Um, yeah. So it's a sort, of, I, it's sort of three main ways from this approach that you can deal with those distractions. Um, one of them is just to name what God is. So the way, the way I've sort of viewed it is like this. It's like, um, let's say, inadequate image, but God is a sort of king sat on a throne that you want to get to and yet he's surrounded by this court of all kinds of demands and journalists and all kinds of stuff and you're trying to push through this crowd mm-hmm. to get to him and there's sort of a few main ways one is one is to name god and go that's love forget the distractions ignore them cut through um another way is to see what god thinks of you god loves me mm-hmm. god places hope in me 
God sees the wisdom in me and that connects us to God. And then the one I, I really kind of like is a lot of our distractions actually in our head are, as you've used the term in previous episodes, they're sort of misdirected virtues anyway. Mm. So I start, um, I start praying and suddenly I'm thinking about how I could communicate this great insight. I've just got to an audience. What's going on? I'm using my social intelligence. I'm thinking creatively. Uh, I'm really hopeful that people will want to hear what I have to say. Um, and sometimes as I spot that, yeah, I can distract myself from it and just go straight back to God. But another way of doing it would just go, thank, thank God for that hope that you've got in you, hmm. even though right now it's not really doing its job. And so sometimes the image that comes to me in those moments is that my mind is like a classroom of children all baying for my attention <laughs> with their like arms that. in the air. And the moment I call on them and name them, they settle down and become much more harmonious. Mm. And that allows me then to, to be with God. So that gets us away from some of the things we were talking about earlier, the whack-a-mole scenario where yes. we're going, that's wrong, that's wrong, stop that, where we're putting more energy into stopping these things than simply naming them. That's what that is gently and now I can move away from it because it's satisfied and it's settled it's beautiful yeah so we've talked about how this could be beneficial to us as individuals and particularly focusing then on what that might mean in terms of the development of character again I think the way we frame that just now is to think about the character of each of us as an individual Mm -hmm. but communities have character Communities develop virtue and, um, yeah, we could think about church communities. We could think about cities. But what, what positive benefit have you seen might you expect? Um, and what, what, how might this change our experience as communities? And, you know, answer this as if it's a church, as if it's a city, as if it's whatever. <laughs> if, how might our churches, our, how might our communities be different if this kind of practice were more widespread? Mm. Yeah, it's a really good question. Do you know, I, as you ask that question, the thing that comes to my mind is, I wonder if this is the only basis on which real community can take place. Mm. Um, Explain that. What do you mean by that? So, so what I mean is um, a centering around something that's bigger than us. Mm. Um, and ultimately, yeah. the only reliable thing that's bigger than us is that presence, the presence of God that transcends all things and is greater and has the ultimate focus of everything. And I think that's where the the church becomes the sort of laboratory mm. or the experiment in what that might look like. And it's really flawed and it's really sporadic and it lets itself down in so many different ways. But you, you in a previous podcast said, once you'd experienced the presence of God, it sort of ruined you for anything else because yep. nothing else seemed to compare to it. And that's my experience too. So I find myself in lots of therapeutic communities psychological academic communities coaching communities and they're good they're doing really really good things Uh, and they'll they'll do some kind of exercise in compassion or contact or getting to know one another and you'll think it is and and everyone will rave about how wonderful it is and it's the most fantastic thing they've ever experienced and yet i now holding that thing of yeah but that experience of presence of god in community i had just outclasses yeah. any of the that psychological stuff is good i yeah, really good. enjoy it but it really the spiritual connection with god outclasses all of it and the church is the place where that can take place yeah so I, so interesting i was leading um our church community um a couple of weeks back so i was you know we take it in turns to lead the meeting and my church leaders asked if i'd like to co-lead so i joined in and was just sort of leading stuff through um and at the end of it, I really struggled to remember anything that happened. And then someone go, you know, you interviewed that person, weirdly, about losing a child. Mm. It was so moving. You were so compassionate to them. Wasn't that brilliant? I could barely remember what I'd said or how it happened. Then somebody came forward because they had a bit of a rash and I was praying for them. And someone was laughing at me afterwards and going, Roger, you were shouting so loud at their rash. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I can remember doing it. Um, yeah. And it's because in that moment, I was just in that really, literally, just this moment, this presence, in the presence of God, what does God require from me in that moment? And it's in, it's in communities like church that I see yes. that energetic beauty of love just sweeping through, um, where, where there's so little ego of you there 
that you can barely remember having done yeah. what you did. You know, I can remember it when people tell me, but I'm just not thinking about it. And that's the experience that some people would say that they have in this kind of prayer, that they'll say in that lifting of your heart to God, every now and then there's this moment where it's not that you doze off, it's not that you get distracted, it's that just for a moment it's almost like you're not there yeah. and God is there in your place. And I think that's the, the deep, profound benefit of this. Yeah. Yeah, in the church, in that way, we can, it's a community in which we can afford to be present. The, the thing that comes to mind as you're speaking, well, the phrase that came to mind, and then I'm going to read a, a small script, a short scripture. The phrase that came to mind was that I think sometimes in the church, or often in the church, we really don't know how good we've got it. And I think that the secular myth that we believe yeah. is that we're just kind of a poor man's university or a poor man's uh, business or a, a academy or whatever it is and actually I think this dimension that we're able to connect with regularly which is the, the theological dimension it's God spiritual dimension is actually so powerful yeah. and Jesus says you are the salt of the earth this is in Matthew 5 if the salt loses its salt and saltiness how could it be made salty again and he goes on to say you're the light of the world a town built on a hill cannot be hidden neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl and he says, go on and let your light shine. And I suppose that, of course, the light isn't us. The light is the glory of God manifest mm. in the people of God. And it strikes me then that really the question we ought to be asking is, how can we get and let more of this light shine so that the cities we're part of and the communities we're part of, the academies, the universities, the businesses, are pervaded by that light? Mm. And they can't be pervaded by that light unless we are. Mm. pervaded by that line mm. and so that's where i guess we come back to this life of contemplative prayer where we're opened up to the presence of god that then enables us to be the hope of the earth yeah in a fresh way yeah and it's almost to me as if that sort of transparency is just what occurs when nothing's getting in the way anymore I've just started to notice how often some of the strategies we talked about in the last episode just get in the way mm. of me showing God. And sometimes even the desire to demonstrate God in the world is the thing that's getting in the way of yeah. me demonstrating God to the world. Um, yeah. I, like the number of times recently where I've heard someone tell a story about someone who sounds really amazing. This person went to this city and they made friends and they saw them saved and it all went really incredibly. And you think, wow, that guy is really amazing. And then suddenly you hear another story about all the work that other people did in the background long before that guy came around. And it wasn't anything to do with him, really. It was just he turned up and reaped the benefit of it all in that moment. Um and increasingly I've started to think I just need to be open to whatever the systemic thing is that God wants to do with me in any given moment. And a lot of the time I probably won't know yeah. what kind of impact I've had. Um, I may not even remember having done anything significant. Yeah. Self-forgetfulness. Mm. So in summary, the benefits of, the pre of God's presence and living in this way are, are there for us. We will experience the blessing of the virtue of the character mm. that God forms in us. And we'll experience that, I think, principally as peace and a settledness yes. of spirit where we are content. And Paul says to Timothy, godliness with contentment is great gain. Yeah. Right. Secondly, our, our families, whether they be nuclear families, whether they be the family of, of people around us, we'll experience that as the blessing of the, what the character God is forming in us. But thirdly, wider communities will experience mm. that. And it, increasingly, the world around us will be transformed as yeah. we are transformed. Yeah. I, do, do you know, as, as you say that, I keep thinking about it. Do you, you know the story about Dallas Willard and they asked him, what's the one word that would come to mind if you had to describe Jesus? Go on. Heard this story. I thought this was the most ridiculous answer to the question I've ever heard. But now I think about it, I really think I've come to believe it's true. So what, what's the one word that comes to mind when you most describe Jesus? Dallas Willard said relaxed mm. I was like really mm. relaxed and now increasingly I think actually that that is the that's the position we adopt when mm. the power of God just is allowed to flow through us without resistance yeah. where we bring pre peace and serenity to every situation we're in 
where instead of responding out of anxiety, anger, resentment, competition, yeah. we respond just out of a sense of what's the good that I need to contribute to this yeah. situation. Um, relaxed is it. Yeah. You know, that, 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 that's, it's a physiological description of a really complex yeah. set of faith, hope, love. Reminds me of, is it St. Francis, make me a channel of your peace? <laughs> like that's relaxed, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Should we recommend some yeah. reading or a few th- places people could go to look at yeah, let's do that. stuff? Maybe, maybe that might be a good way to end. <laughs> yeah. Um, so obviously I, I've been citing the cloud of unknowing quite a bit. Um, I've become a, a big fan of the translator of the cloud of unknowing that I've been reading. So she's called Carmen Avisado Butcher. And uh, in recent years, not only has she done this absolutely fantastic translation of the cloud of unknowing, she also last year completed a translation of the practice of the presence of god by brother lawrence as well mm-hmm. so she um she's a wonderful scholar very well connected to the sort of mystical tradition as well and therefore really understands what's going on uh, so i'd really recommend those two translations yep. to people if they're looking at that talks about bernard mcginn didn't you previously bernard mcginn yeah so he's um I mean, it really is for the scholars of mysticism, I, okay. I would guess, rather than it's not necessarily the lights, like on equivalent with N.T. Wright's books on the yeah, New I'm Testament. Much, much it's, then. it's a scholarly <laughs> scholarly thing, but that's called The, the Presence of God, and the, the first volume of it, um, each one is the something of mysticism. The Foundations of Mysticism is what the first okay. volume is called. I think he intended to write two volumes and then it gradually became nine as, <laughs> it, ran, as it does <laughs> once he started um but yeah they're wonderful if people really want to pursue that that side of things mm-hmm. um the 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 other person we've talked about quite a bit is frank laubach yeah so frank laubach that's just um, a modern mystic would be the the famous is that right yes well so the 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 book i read is the game with minutes yeah so it's like his tiny little yeah. sort of I think you can download a PDF of it on like, literally if you search Frank Laubach online, mm-hmm. you get an 11 page PDF of it and just download yep. it instantly. Um, but his notion was ultimately uh, like he, he starts off with a lovely phrase. He says, most of us don't get enough of Jesus to save ourselves or anybody else. Mm. And he does this whole calculation about, um, I think he says something like it's like most of us are exposed to Jesus for something like 30 minutes a week in church. That That's like, that's our whole consciousness of Jesus. So I, I did a little calculation for myself in terms of if, if that's the case in all the minutes of my day over the week, how likely is it that someone is going to encounter me in a moment when I've just been present to Jesus? Yeah. And I think I calculated something like it, the the odds were something like seven in a hundred million. <laughs> oh. It's like really, really low that I've just been spending time with Jesus um, based on his calculation of you, if you just do it in church. So it's like, how do I just start yep. to extend that? Laubach's really good as a challenge. I think we have to go elsewhere to really see what that means in practice. Um, my favorite place on that at the moment is uh, Jean-Pierre de Cossard's book which is called Abandonment to Divine Providence. Mm -hmm. It doesn't sound like a lot of fun, that book, does it? But it is. And there's a lovely edition edited by someone called Dennis Billy. And Dennis Billy has written a commentary on it, and he explains what's going on in it. Um, And he also has a fascinating introduction where he says there's a good chance that de Corsard didn't actually write it, but it was just found in a Mm -hmm. bundle of manuscripts. We don't actually know who wrote it, like a lot of these mystical text it's become anonymous mm-hmm. like the cloud of unknowing as well yeah who knows who wrote this um yes yeah, so there's some good places to start so uh, yeah uh cloud of unknowing uh practicing the presence of god brother lawrence game with minutes frank laubach um yeah div- abandonment to divine providence by de Corsard. um and then for the real scholars um bernard mcginn's nine volumes uh, called the presence of God, yeah. and then and the final thing would be to say just start, just start, start doing it, and see start where now. you go. Start yeah. now. That, that that's the weird thing about this. You know, the moment you've thought about it, you can begin. Yeah. You know how we sometimes get that our, our character strategies would always tell us we're miles from God and we've got yes. a whole pile of stuff to do to get over to get to Him, and it's not actually true. It's like yeah. literally 
take a breath and be aware of him in this moment. Should we do that now? Yeah, let's do that. Where we just turn our attention to you and our affection to you. You're the source of all light and hope and love in our lives. We love you. Thank you that you love us just as we are. Lead us from this moment. May we become ever more relaxed. And even now we just choose to relax. We sit back. We receive from you what you're already here to bring. We thank you. Father, we just thank you. It's not that we are here and you are elsewhere. It's that you are here and we are so often elsewhere. And so we rest in you. We settle ourselves in you. We quieten ourselves in your presence. And I pray that as we bring these podcasts to a close, I pray for those who've listened, that their consciousness and awareness of you would be enhanced. They'd learn that moment to pause and be present to you. And as a consequence, your presence would be more well known in the world. Yeah. Mm-hmm.